And good morning, good morning. Happy Wednesday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. We are right in the midst of our summary of what we have seen earlier in the Olivet Discourse, although, remember, I'm adding a few additional tidbits that I didn't cover uh, in the in our initial study. So I hope that you'll continue to tune in for that because I do want to give you as much information uh, as possible. We are focused right now on Matthew chapter 24, part, pardon me, verse 36, which is considered by most amillennial and postmillennial scholars and commentators to be the pivotal turning point. It's the key to understanding Matthew chapter 24, because it is argued in Matthew 24, verse uh, 2 and 3, when Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem and, and the temple, the apostles ignorantly, uh, confusedly linked the fall of the temple with the end of the world, with the end of the Christian age. Now, couple of factors here, ladies and gentlemen, as I pointed out yesterday. This is the foundational presupposition that guides the understanding of Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour knows no man. So the argument goes like this. Verses 4 to 34, Jesus knew the generation. He knew the time, the generation to be sure, of the fall of Jerusalem. Verily I say unto you, this generation will by no means pass until all of these things are fulfilled. Now, what was all of these things? His coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and the attendant signs of that. So the disciples, the apostles are asking about the coming of the Lord. Verses 29 to 31, coming of the Lord. In that generation. And yet, once again, the presupposition is, well, back here in verse 3, though, uh, the apostles are not asking about a, a figurative spiritual coming of Christ in which he used his sovereign judgment authority uh, to use the Romans to destroy Jerusalem. No, no, that's, that's, that can't be what, he's, what Jesus is talking about in verse 36 and following. Now, in verse 36 and following, the apostles are talking about the end of time. Well, a couple of factors here. Why is it necessary, as I shared with you yesterday, John Calvin said, it was not possible for the apostles to believe that the temple would fall unless it was at the end of time. Who said so? Where does this argument come from? Oh, it's presuppositional. Let me ask you to consider this. Were the apostles acutely aware, I mean acutely aware, of the fact that Jerusalem and the temple had been destroyed in 586 B.C.? <laughs> I mean, to ask that is to answer it, right? No Jew of the first century could not know that the Jerusalem temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. You know, as a matter of fact, they had four separate feast days, or fasts, I should say, according to Zechariah chapter 8, to commemorate the significant events during the siege and destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. So here we've got four yearly fasts to commemorate the destruction of the temple, and yet we're told, commentator after commentator after commentator tells us, oh, well, you know, the apostles just automatically thought about the end of time when Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple. Why? Why would they even think of such a thing? Listen, there are many, many scholars, and I know there's some disagreement about this, but there are many scholars who argue, N.T. Wright, R.T. France, Davidson, I mean, the list goes on, of scholars who say 
the Jews never believed in the destruction of material creation. Period. Now, there are scholars, certainly, who believe uh, Adams is one of them. And when the stars fell from heaven, he argues that that language of cosmic decreation has to be interpreted literally. How do, uh, it's really fascinating in that book that he argues that because in the Old Testament, in passage after passage after passage, the prediction was made that heaven and earth was going to be destroyed at the fall of this kingdom or that kingdom. That kingdom or this kingdom fell, and yet literal physical heaven and earth uh, was not destroyed. So Adams has to take the position, well, okay, the prophet was wrong <clears throat> about the passing of creation, but they were right concerning the fall of that nation. His presupposition is the language of decreation, cosmic decreation, has to be literal. No, it doesn't. That there's no logic in that. That's to say that, that the Hebrews could not express themselves poetically when most scholars uh, uh, understanding the very nature of Hebraic thought understand that the Hebrews thought poetically, picturesquely. They thought in figures and mental images more than in hard, fast, prosaic literalism. So, the great question becomes, if the apostles knew, understood, and commemorated the fall of Jerusalem and the temple in 586 as a past event, then why would they think of the end of time, the end of the Christian age, when Jesus predicted the destruction of the first century temple? I want to know what the hermeneutical principle is that demands that view. You know what? The only reason for that view is, as I shared with you yesterday, presuppositions. Presuppositions that control the hermeneutic. Presuppositions that control the interpretation. The apostles had to be confused they had to be ignorant, and they had to be thinking about Jesus coming out of heaven in a literal, physical human body instead of being manifested as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And the apostles had to be thinking about the end of the Christian age. And look, ladies and gentlemen, I once believed all of that, okay? I once taught all of that until I began to look at the context, until I began to realize, you know what? Guess what? The Old Covenant in passage after passage after passage sets forth the reality that, for instance, the resurrection would be at the time of the destruction of the power of the holy of the people. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, verse 7 the coming in of the new heaven and the new earth would come at the time of the destruction of old covenant Israel, Isaiah 65, 13 to 19. The Lord's coming in flaming fire in the judgment of all flesh would take place at the time of the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, Isaiah 66, 3 through 17 which would also be the time of, guess what, the new heaven and the new earth. By the way, you do understand, I know you do, that the arrival of the new heaven and the new earth only comes at the time of the resurrection. Thus, when Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66 foretold the coming of the new heaven and new earth at the time of the destruction of of, the, of Jerusalem and the temple, it was predicting the resurrection at the time of the destruction of Old Covenant Israel. Resurrection and destruction of Israel, Old Covenant Israel, are hand in glove. They are inseparable. Okay, so here we've got the following facts. Unless the apostles were, to use the modern terminology, dumber than a box of rocks in regard 
to the Old Testament teaching about the end of the age, the coming of the new creation, the time of the resurrection, then we have a perfect right to postulate, okay, the apostles understood Daniel chapter 12 and the prediction of the resurrection at the time of the destruction of the power of the holy people. And let's see if that's true, okay? In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus told the parable of the sower who went out to sow. And he sowed his seed, some fell on good, good soil, rocky soil, etc., etc. While the master of the vineyard slept, Satan came in and sowed tares. The servants of the master came when the tares had sprung up and said, Master, we have tares among the wheat. Shall we go and separate them? And the Lord says, the master of the vineyard or the wheat says, <clears throat> no, let them both grow together until the time of the harvest. And at that time, separation will take place. And then Jesus spoke of the end of the age, the suntulia to aonio, the same identical term used by the apostles when they're asking about the end of the age in Matthew 24, verse 3. Matthew 13, harvest is at the end of the age. Matthew 13, 39. Matthew chapter 24, tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of the end of the age? Soon to Leah to Aeoniu. Same thing. If not, why not? Kenneth Gentry makes a humongous hermeneutical blunder that has no merit whatsoever. And he says, Matthew reserves this distinctive Greek term for the, for the description of the final coming of the Lord at the end of human history. Nonsense. And again, I mean, no, I mean, no disrespect whatsoever. Let's see, Matthew chapter 13, back to it. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they shall gather, <clears throat> pardon me, <sighs> and they shall gather together the wheat first, gather it into the barn. They shall gather together the tares, and throw them into the fire. So shall it be at the end of the age. Soon to Leah, to Aeonio. Then we come to Matthew chapter 13, 1551. Jesus tells another parable about the end of the age, and he asks his apostles. <clears throat> now remember, and I've got another verse to bring to your attention. Do you understand these things? Now there's a critical question. Because Jesus is talking about the end of the age, the suntalia to aeoniu of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3. Now, watch this. At the end of that age, Matthew 13, 43, then shall the righteous shine forth in the kingdom as the brightness of the stars. Then when? At the end of the age. Folks, do you realize that Jesus was drawing directly on Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 and 3? Verse 2, resurrection. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall arise. Some to everlasting life, some to everlasting condemnation. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the brightness of the firmament. When would that resurrection be? <clears throat> when would that time of the righteous shining forth in the kingdom be? Oh, when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. Matthew 13, 43. At the end of the age, by the way, Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 and 4, the time of the end. The suntalia, Cairo, suntalia, that's our word in Matthew chapter 13 and, 4, and 23. At the appointed time of the end is when the righteous would shine forth in the kingdom at the time of the resurrection. Matthew chapter 13. Now, Jesus, after citing Daniel 12, <clears throat> saying it would be fulfilled at the coming of the Son of Man, tells another parable about the end of the age and asked his apostles. And remember, this is what's critical. 
Jesus applied Daniel chapter 12 to the end of the age, to the soon to Leah, to Aonio, which Daniel said would be when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. Daniel, time of the harvest, end of the age, when the righteous would shine, when the power of the holy people is completely shattered. Matthew chapter 13, coming of the Son of Man, time of the harvest, the end of the age, when the righteous would shine forth in the kingdom. And Jesus now asked his apostles, remember, do you understand? Well, you know, Lord, I, I just don't really get it. Uh, uh, surely the temple, uh, surely the end of the age, uh, I, that, that, that can't be when the power of the holy people is completely shattered, like Daniel said. Uh, and, and Lord, in just a few days, we're going to ask you about the fall of the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, you know, I, I, we're asking about the very same thing you told Talk to us about Matthew 13, but uh, we, we know, we know, surely we know that the fall of the temple can't be related to the time of the destruction of the power of the holy people like Daniel said it would be. No, that's not what they said. They didn't say, Lord, we don't understand. Matthew doesn't tell us they didn't understand. the apostles, when Jesus asked about his interpretation and application of Daniel chapter 12, the time of the resurrection, time of the harvest, time of the end of the age, do you understand? And they said, yes, Lord. You know what Kenneth Gentry says? Oh, well, I know they said they understood, but they didn't really. And so he gives a modern illustration of saying, how many times have somebody asked us if we understood something and, and we really didn't, but we didn't want to acknowledge our ignorance. Uh, so we said we understood anyway. That's what's going on in Matthew 13. Really? Where's the proof of that? Listen, I wrote a four-part or series on Kenneth Gentry's confusion on the ostensible apostles' confusion. They're found on my website. Just go to donkpreston.com. In the search bar, just type in, uh, were the apostles confused? Uh, responding to Kenneth Gentry, et cetera, et cetera. In addition to that, I've written a book entitled Watching for the Parousia, Were Jesus' Apostles Confused? Listen, this book hit so hard that while Kenneth Gentry has normally tried his very dead level best to ignore me and to ignore my books, even though he's had them, that book hit so hard that he had to write in response to it. He didn't do a very good job, mind you, but he had to write a response to it. So go to my website, read the four articles, go to the website, order a copy of Were the Apostles Confused. So here's a final thought. When the apostles asked, what should be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Let me ask you this closing question. What age did that temple represent? Now remember, the fall of that temple is that day and hour that the apostles are asking about. That's the end of the age they're asking about. Did the Jerusalem temple, in which at one time was stored the Ark of the Covenant, containing the two tablets, containing the Old Covenant, what temple, excuse me, what age did that temple represent? Did it represent the New Covenant age? No. Did it represent Jesus' messianic rule in his age? No, there's only one age that that temple represented. 
There's only one age, therefore, that the apostles would have had in mind when they said, tell us, what should be the sign of the end of the age? They're not asking about the end of the Christian age. They're not asking about the end of time. They're asking about the end of the age represented and symbolized by the Jerusalem temple. That was the old covenant age of Moses and the law. And that meant, and that means, when Jesus said, but of that day and hour, that day and hour of the end of the age, he wasn't changing subjects. He was continuing his discussion of the destruction of the temple, the destruction of heaven and earth. I'm out of time. Thanks for joining me. See you on Friday as we continue to respond <clears throat> to Steve Gregg's final concluding arguments in his book, Why Not Full Preterism. Okay? Have a fantastic week. See you there.